So I've been incredibly impressed with the support that this program has been given over the last eight years or so, and really that's uh, testim um, th there's testament to that in the people around this room. They're really an impressive group of people. I really want to thank you for coming. Uh, first of all. All right, thanks. So, um, and the other thing is, uh, I guess it's good that uh, Eric didn't say that I was the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, because then I wished I'd had a brain. And today, I'm going to tell you about how the UDP worked and how the UDN is now working, and how we can map the UDP um, onto the UDN, or should we, essentially. And I would say that this is a non-surjective function. So how many people in the room would know what a non-surjective function is? Good, because I didn't either. <clears throat> Tom Markello told me what it is. It's a function that doesn't map every um, x to a y. <clears throat> so it's non-surjective. So we don't really think of those functions very often. So let me go through how uh, we established the UDP and what it's uh, characterized by, and then how the UDN is moving from that or, um, yeah, or towards that. The UDP was established to help patients reach a diagnosis and also discover new diseases, and because we're the NIH, we have to do some research and some science. So the way it works is that people apply, and they apply with their doctor's recommendation, a, a letter. And then for the adults, I look at the records, and for the kids, Cindy Tift looks at the records. We give them to the consultants around the NIH who are all intramural, and then they tell us what they think, you know, is this a suitable case or isn't it? And we reject about 75, 80 percent of the patients. We actually accept about 50 percent of the kids and only about 20 percent of the adults. And you can sort of figure out why that might be in terms of the balance of subjective complaints versus objective findings. <clears throat> and then we give some advice to some of the patients. But we see patients for one week as inpatients at the clinical center, and it doesn't cost them anything. We even pay for their travel. And then we do incredible phenotyping because the NIH Clinical Center has an infrastructure that allows that. And genetic studies, which can be commercial, we do SNPs to essentially inform our exome analysis, and then we do functional studies in some of them we can, that we can. And the conclusions that we've drawn over the years are that phenotyping is critical and, and important, and everybody knows that. So really, the issue then is how can we achieve the best phenotyping? Half of the R diagnoses are not made on next generation sequencing. They're made because we have doctors who come together, talk with each other, see the patients in an intense fashion for a week. Functional studies are rate limiting. They always have been and they always will because sometimes a functional study to determine whether <clears throat> a variant is actually pathogenic requires a year or two or three years of work by a postdoctoral fellow. Sharing of sequence and phenotypic information is essential, and undiagnosed disease patients are, are desperate. So how does this convert now to the UDN? Strong phenotyping is critical. Again, everybody knows that. We do inpatient admissions at the NIH because we can and because we think that it's incredibly important for the patients to be available throughout an entire week for our consultants to come and, and meet other consultants in the hall and have uh, meetings over these individuals. This is not something that may necessarily be convertible to an extramural system, and we're finding that out. So I think that one of the things that we need to discuss here is for the sustainability of a program like this, how can we, let's say, achieve the essence of this program, basically having physicians talk together about a patient in an extramural setting. Nurse practitioners play a huge role in our system, either uh, NPs or uh, PAs. <clears throat> and this is not something that's uh, necessarily done in every one of the clinical sites that's being supported by the uh, UDM. I'll give you one example of why we think it's important. When we do phenotypes, which is the ontology system that needs to be entered for all of our patients for searching and comparability of um, cases, the people who fill out those, um, th that phenotypes is largely nurse practitioners uh, at, at the NIH. In other centers, if this is given to attending physicians, it takes longer to get done, or sometimes it doesn't get done. I mean, even at our center, it doesn't get done well by the attending physicians. It gets done by the people who are seeing the patients for probably maybe 
15 to 20 face hours in a week. Those are the nurse practitioners. Critically important uh, element, which again, may not be recapitulated extramurally. A friendly user ontology is essential, and in fact, the UDN has picked up the ontology that we picked up at the UDP. It's not necessarily, you know, 100% sure that that's the best, but the point is that uh, an ontology system has been picked up that's been uh, made universal. The second conclusion was half of our diagnoses are not based on next generation sequencing. There's a misconception sometimes that the UDP and the UDN is a sequencing program. It's not a sequencing program. The essence of this is that we see patients as physicians and we get other physicians to come together and look at the patients and make a diagnosis. It's also not uh, solely a genetics program. We'll see patients who have any sort of uh, illness as long as it's undiagnosed. And in fact, the UDN understands that and has an environmental survey involved with it, also model organisms and gene function cores. And again, it's not uh, necessarily, it's solely a sequencing program, although we now have exome and genome sequencing cores that provide us with service in the undiagnosed disease network. There are some sites that do sequence the patients before th they see them, and we're going to try to determine over the course of these phases whether or not that's a beneficial thing or if it's not beneficial. We really don't know that yet. Functional studies are rate limiting, and the um, <clears throat> undiagnosed disease program has used many different ways to achieve this. For one thing, we have some in-house money, and therefore we have in-house postdocs and post -bac, uh, students who work on some of the projects that emanate from our program. For another, we have uh, contracts that we can let, and also the UDN has let supplements to RFAs, uh, to R01s, and also RFAs by the uh, R21 mechanism, and we have collaborators who work on projects for no money at all. And the collaborators are experts in the field, and basically what they want to do, I think, is to tie their research to a human disease and a, a human being for the, basically, introduction to their next R01. The UDN itself has a gene function core, and it has a model systems core, and the clinical sites have the purview to use investigators at their own institutions to pursue uh, the basic research into the variants that they find in the um, patients. Sharing of data is essential. So the UDP has shared its phenotypes and its variants in a variety of ways, on a national level and on an international level now. There is an undiagnosed disease network international that's been established, and uh, there's a white paper in molecular genetics and metabolism on that. We share through the coordinating center, and uh, the, the network shares through the coordinating center and can share internationally, and this was founded in the Institutional Review Board protocol that we wrote. In other words, the protocol and the consent allow for two things. One is the sharing of personally identified information among the members of the network. So that's a bit paradigm changing, and it was approved by the NHGRI Institutional Review Board. And it really is based on our experience that the patients want to tell their stories. They want to find another individual who has the same disorder, another uh, family. And the second element is that the protocol and the consent allow for the sharing of de-identified information more broadly, that is, with collaborators uh, at the research level, not really necessarily the clinical level, but at the research level. And, and the UDN <coughs> has used language basically drafted from the uh, protocol that we wrote a uh, long time ago and has actually changed over the, over the years. And then uh, the protocol then has a, the uh, UDN has a single protocol <clears throat> that uh, relies upon reliance agreements by every one of the um, sites that's involved in the UDN. And again, we share the uh, information there. <clears throat> and, and finally, undiagnosed uh, patients are desperate, and this is a, a function that uh, does map from the UDP to the UDN. Everybody recognizes uh, this as soon as you see one of these uh, individual patients. So that's what I've got. I think I uh, made it short. In case there were questions, are, are you taking questions? Yeah, we have a few minutes if folks have some questions. Yes, sir. Um, I apologize if everybody else knows this except me, but I'm not in the in network. But is the, is the consent form written broadly enough so that you, that you don't have to ever in, uh, 
consider going back for further uh, permission? I mean, is it written broadly for application of all the data out to other applications? Y yes, we think it is. I, I think, you know, since I wrote it, maybe <laughs> that's a little bit of a biased view. But there are other people. What do you think, Rachel? Do you think this is broad broadly enough uh, written for, for future changes? It was intentionally written quite broadly, although there, there, of course, may be some circumstances in which we need to go back to patients, but uh, intentionally for educational purposes, for sharing with outside databases, for sharing with other researchers, uh, all of those are encompassed in the, in the consent uh, form. I'll give you an example uh, in a way. We had to change our protocol about four years ago or so when IPS cells came in, and we uh, into, uh, incorporated that into the protocol and the consent. That's already in, in the UDN consent. But if something like that came along in the future, we may have to go and change it. Uh, well, one thing I would ask specifically, is there, is there continuing interaction with those patients? I mean, can you incorporate some outcomes data or, or you know, continuing data about the patients? Is there provision for that? <clears throat> we, we're allowed to con recontact them, yes. They are now our patients in terms of uh, us actually being doctors to them. I mean, they contact us all the time. And they can. And we can contact them. Yeah. In the UDN as well, yes, that's correct. Hi, Judy. Um, do you have a patient family user group um, that sort of continually kind of asks the question of or gives advice or um, raise, you can raise issues with? Well, r right now we have uh, Matt Might who helps us with some of the social media and gives us a perspective from that standpoint. And written in is to establish such a group. Um, I think I should ask Rachel how we're doing on that. So yes, we're, we're in the process of forming a, a patient engagement group specifically for that purpose. The, the question um, that, uh, that is giving us a bit of pause is how to engage the, these families without overburdening them because um, we would be asking for some of their time. So of course you wouldn't have everybody, but it seems like some kind of user group that meets a couple of times a year um, to sort of say, okay, how things have gone. And part of it is that's become the way to do business. But when you set things up, it wasn't necessarily. But I think my guess is that the parent support groups would really love to see you do that. And the other part is newbies, like just the desperate new ones, have a different perspective than somebody who the diagnosis has been found, from somebody who um, the diagnosis didn't really help. But yeah, I mean, I think they have very different perspectives over time. Agreed. Uh, w w Walter? Yeah, so uh, uh, may maybe from the, from the neurologic perspective, um, uh, there, there are numerous patients that nobody knows what they have. And they go around from doctor to doctor and everybody asks the same questions. Everybody does the same kind of exam. And uh, so the question comes up is, is, is there an effective way in which you could capture that information, maybe even in a video uh, of the patient uh, interview, and have that kind of stored so that people could access it? And I mean, I'm not sure if it's helpful for the non-neurologic cases, but to be able to see that kind of interaction, get that history, I mean, you can almost think of putting it out and, you know, having people around the world try and take a shot at what the problem is. Is that, is that kind of thing, do you think, feasible? Well, so, so Dennis Landis, when he was, you know, actively with us, actually wrote a bunch of um, best practices for the investigation of an undiagnosed neurological uh, case. That was written. It wasn't video. Are you sort of getting at um, doing this for an individual case where you'd like that case to be solved, or are you asking more for general principles that are illus illustrated by a video of uh, how to do an exam and how, what questions to ask for a new disease? You know, I'm thinking, uh, you know, for an individual case, because, you know, what, I'm just imagining if, if, if it, may, it may be off, but, you know, someone might see something and they have an idea, um, but it doesn't gel until they see the other one. Right. And so to be able to have, you know, a library of these kind of cases, because I think that's that's how people develop their expertise over time. They start seeing different things, and they they're kind of correlating. I saw this case before, and this one looks like this, and that's how things come together. So I'm just wondering, in a collaborative way, 
you know, thinking with modern techniques as opposed to sending the patient around to different doctors, you, you bring all the data and then doc different doctors can all look at the same data. Right. I think that that is in a way data sharing. A and the way that we're sharing data now is to have the phenotypes, um, let's say, categorized by an ontology that allows searchability and also to have the, the uh, variants uh, put in a database that's shared. What you're suggesting is going one step further, I think, uh, having videos. And we do take videos of many of our patients, especially, you know, the very special ones. Disseminating those videos <clears throat> maybe is a little bit more difficult. Uh, in, in other words, uh, videos by and large are not searchable. So in that case, we'd have to be a little bit selective about um, whom we would give the videos to for a particular um, consultation. But I absolutely agree that that is the most poignant way of uh, finding uh, similarities, and that's critical. Um, I, I, do you want us to add something, uh, Rachel, before I go to? So um, at, at the Coordinating Center, and Anastasia knows this, I don't know you, if you, Bill, yet are aware of this, but we have been exploring potential partnerships with um, networks of doctors that are doing collaborative case solving to potentially post um, either solved UDN cases to educate a broader audience about undiagnosed diseases and how they, they should be worked up, as well as unsolved cases to crowdsource. And um, at the Department of Biomedical Informatics, where I was previously at Harvard, um, they had done crowdsourcing uh, around undiagnosed diseases um, that were uh, that was focused at kind of sequencing cores. This would be more focused at, at clinicians. And so I think that that is a promising avenue and including the videos is, is very important. Yeah. Maren? Uh, I was just going to comment that um, in the VA system, we use telemedicine pretty heavily and also, so that could be, you know, a one-on-one -on -one with a patient at a distant site with their provider also perhaps in the room. Um, and it, it might be a way of actually not having the patient have to travel, but that they can get expertise from a whole bunch of other clinicians. You could even do it all at one time where you have multiple providers in different places um, with, with telehealth technology. And then there's also store and forward technology so that you could, you know, send images or videos for consultation with another provider. So it's, it's clinical care. Um, that is provided in certain health systems that have that capability. So just maybe something, I don't know if that's, you know, anything anyone has considered. Yep. So we're right at time now, but I know, John Mink, you've had your hand up. So why don't we take that as the last question for this session? Just very quickly, because I know this is a topic for discussion later today, but one of the things that makes undiagnosed uh, patients desperate is that their physicians say, I don't know what you have, so I don't know how to treat it. And particularly for the UDP, uh, the intramural program, what is typically done in terms of treatment recommendations once a diagnosis is made, or are those uh, recommendations even made? We do, we do make recommendations, largely asking that the local physician pick it up. In fact, that's one of the criteria for acceptance, that there has to be someone who's willing to do that. But sometimes the disease is so new that there's no authority in it, and then we do take over some of that. And for example, in the last fiscal year, we saw 20, 20 to 25 patients a second time, you know, basically for that follow-up because there was some treatment that. And I would also mention that uh, sometimes the ancillary services of the NIH Clinical Center are incredibly helpful in that. Rehabilitation medicine, for example, or some of the consultations in heme or uh, immunology, things of that sort are, are extremely beneficial. Rheumatology, when they have, like, uh, new drugs. And sometimes even the clinical center can provide those new drugs and the insurance won't, you know, just, although don't tell anybody at the clinical center that. But, but that's, that's what we do. Uh, unfortunately, with these genetic diseases, there may not be an awful lot of cases in which the therapy is directed. Uh, thank you.